My name is Leticia Thomas, and I serve as the Assistant Dean for Diversity in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at UB. And I'd like to welcome you to the fifth annual Women's STEM Cooperative Summit. We are honored to have a special guest to give us welcome this morning. I'd like to present to you the 15th president of the University of Buffalo, Satish K. Tripathi. Welcome to UB's uh, sixth annual uh, Women in STEM Summit. I'm delighted to join all of our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and university friends and guests who are here with us today. And I want to thank the members of the UB Women in STEM Cooperative and our sponsors for bringing together mentors and thought leaders to inspire and support and to support our students, faculty, professionals, in STEM fields. At UB, we are committed to fostering a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment for our students, faculty, and staff. This is who we are and how we identify it as a campus community. When we pursue our research and scholarship in an environment where all feel respected, and all have the same opportunities, we are best positioned to excel in these pursuits. Among higher education institutions, UB has long been a leader in promoting and improving opportunities for women and minorities in STEM fields and entrepreneurship. These include programs such as the Institute for Strategic Enhancement of Educational Diversity, also known as IC, Women in Science and Engineering programs and summer camps in high school girls, for high school girls, and the All State Minority and Women Emerging Entrepreneurs, the MWEE program. Thanks to our intentional planning, we know that efforts such as these are working to improve diversity and increase the number of women studying in STEM disciplines. In the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, for example, the percentage of both women and underrepresented students has gone up, creating a more equitable, diverse, and inclusive student body as a result. It has gone up, but it has really not gone up to where it should be. In the, uh, STEM fields, especially in certain fields of engineering, the percentage is less than 15 or less than 20 percent. And that really has been a tradition, quote unquote, for a long time. And we are really not able to improve that to beyond 25 percent. In some other fields, though, we have 30 percent, 35 percent, but there are fields in engineering and sciences that still are lacking the women representation among the students. In the faculty side also, we have really lack of diversity in the STEM field. The SUNY program known as Prodigy is encouraging that to hire underrepresented faculty members in different fields. And underrepresented is defined really based on those fields, not necessarily for all campus. So there's a strong push to hire women faculty in the STEM field. SUNY is providing some of the resources and we have some of our own resources to do that. So, so we are really uh, working in this direction. So as I said, while we have made great progress, we are dedicated to continue to bridge the STEM gap to cultural inclusion and educational opportunity. Thank you again for joining us today. I wish you all the best for the most enlightening and productive conversation. It is now my pleasure to give the stage back to
And this is our panel lined up. Um, and then also please join us for a group reception at 1 o'clock in the student union social hall. And also please tweet with us. Um, our um, address is UBWISC. And then the hashtags are UBWISC2020 and UB Women in STEM. So as you are engaging throughout the day, please tweet, uh, tweet photos, um, tweet your reactions, um, and help us celebrate um, our program this morning. So the Women in STEM Cooperative is committed to empowering women in STEM by offering engaging content, authentic conversations, and supportive and supportive communities to women students, faculty, and professionals in STEM from UB and Western New York. WISC was established in 2013 by an interdisciplinary co coalition of women volunteers from across the university who pooled our resources to benefit other women. Each year, we bring thought, a thought leader to campus to share new visions, mission, goals, and ideals for advancing women in STEM. This year, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Tanya Matthews. Dr. Matthews serves as the Director of the STEM Innovation Learning Center and Associate Provost for Inclusive Workforce Development at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And you can read her official bio in your program. Um, but I've had the pleasure of hanging out with Dr. Matthews for the past couple of days. Uh, we found out we're sorority sisters. Um, we splashed around campus all day yesterday. And each person that I put in front of her, she immediately began wonderful conversations. Um, she was funny. She was charming. She was disarming. Um, she was intuitive. She was inclusive. Um, and she had a wonderful ability to put everyone at ease. Uh, she offered lots of folk wisdom. Uh, she had her take on the arts, politics, education policy, and all of this mixed with her considerable and incredible academic credentials. I know you will enjoy getting to know her as much as I did, so please welcome Dr. Tanya Mahal. Good morning. All right, that was part of the comedy she mentioned. I felt pressure uh, to make sure I represented in this So I am very excited uh, to be joining uh, you all uh, this morning, a uh, sister university in a sister conversation uh, that we are having around sort of various issues. Uh, in uh, diversity and inclusion in STEM uh, with an interesting focus on, on women. Although one of the things that I have found in my work is that uh, the more you do for the least, the better it works out for everyone. And so I think that a lot of the, the conversation that we're going to have this morning is easily translatable um, to a lot of the, the different strategies. So, because uh, you all have been in this conversation and doing this for quite some time, one of the things that I do like to acknowledge is that when it comes to this work, while we have far to go, we are not in the shoes, right? We have been looking at these concepts for quite some time. And of course, we are academia, so we got data and graphs and tables. And so part of what I wanted to do was to ground us in some of the things that we know but give us a moment to reflect on how we could possibly use some of these terms. Uh, so talking in terms of the trends, learning curves, lessons, and STEM equity. Uh, and it was funny, when I was trying to think about how to subtitle this, what can this tell us about our 2050 goals? I thought that sounded far enough out to not be scary. If I said 2030, that sounds maybe too close because it's 2020. Even if I think about the 21st century, <laughs> we've only got 80 years left. 
So, just in terms of thinking through uh, those things. Oh, wait, there you go. Ah. Yeah. Okay, more questions. So the first slide uh, is really just filler while we uh, sort of figure this out. Um, as Letitia mentioned, I am the director of the Stimulation Learning Center at Wayne State University, an associate provost for inclusive workforce development. One of the things we have been talking about STEM, right, so it's the integration and interdisciplinary look at all of these different fields. And largely we've been thinking about that on K-12. What we have not necessarily done as aggressively is think about how that might affect pedagogy at the higher education level. One of the reasons is scale, right? When we're at the university level, you know, disciplines mean buildings. I've actually seen the engineering building. So some of our disciplines need a quarter of campus. I can say so, I am an engineer. Uh, and so in terms of thinking through that, it has led to some of the challenges around thinking about a STEM approach. So Wayne State uh, has re-renovated uh, our former science and engineering library. Um, with support from the state and a bond issue, uh, we made a $50 million investment to construct a facility that was designed to support uh, STEM education and that would be utilized by all of the STEM, STEM-friendly, STEM-allied fields uh, in the university, and that goes from classrooms to lab spaces, which is a very interesting um, concept for us to, to try to address. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm going to do as we, as we go through the conversation um, uh, and you will sort of see uh, the engineer in me come out, lots of numbers and charts, four sections. <laughs> so we're going to have a conversation, four sections. Uh, so the first uh, is going to be, where are we? Uh, you know, it's very interesting when you start looking into the space and you're looking for data, it is a lovely rabbit hole. There is so much data out there and so much good work. You can really get, uh, get lost uh, in this space. Um, but the National Center for Education Statistics, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics um, are some really good sources of um, direction in terms of where to dig. And I pulled heavily from that to talk about where we are. And then I don't want to make any assumptions. And so I will state um, sort of my uh, strongest beliefs about why we need to move. Uh, and I am a fan, while I believe in doing the right thing, it is rarely a justification for spending money or time. Uh, and so as we think about why we need to move, I wanted us to reflect on some of the, the frankly, self-enlightenment sustainability uh, issues uh, around why we need to move from this space. The third section, uh, we are going to talk about the assets, tools, and levers. Thank you. The assets, tools, and levers uh, that we have. The assets, tools, and levers uh, that we have uh, and that we have been using and that we have data for to talk about um, how they are helpful, what we find is and is not helpful. One of the interesting things is that almost every single one of our tools and levers when we talk about STEM equity, when we talk about women, when we talk about uh, students of color has a caveat associated with it. Uh, and then last but not least, we're going to ask sort of that big question. So where do we want to go? We know where we are, and we know where we need to move, and we sort of take stock of the tools and levers that we have. What kind of big, audacious goal would we set for 2050? And then I'll tell you how to get there. We have it all figured out, don't we? Use the papers. So where we are. So I have to face good news, right? So women slightly outnumber men in higher education, uh, enrollment across every race and ethnicity that we now actually currently track. Um, some of you may recognize we have been in that position in one way or the other since the 1970s. Um, but, and so that's one of the things that we are now seeing across the board, right? And so this is important and critical because it's culturally relevant. Um, and so there are uh, some who have made studies and arguments around different cultures who are progressing into that space uh, in different ways. But now in all the categories, represented, underrepresented, that we typically track, 
uh, women are slightly ahead of the gentlemen, 50, 51 percent, 52 percent, which is actually aligned with the population. Uh, so that works. That said, the proportion of degrees awarded to women in science and engineering varies widely across and within the fields of study, um, but is not keeping pace with enrollment or with population, right? So this is really an interesting uh, and sort of mixed bag, and I'm going to show you some um, specific uh, data on that. Um, you know, I want to give uh, a shout out to the folks at NTSES. This is a fantastic way of uh, creating this chart and this data. If you're looking at uh, sort of my far left, your far right, you're looking at absolute numbers. And if you're looking at my right, your left, you're actually looking at percentages. Because we need to actually break some of that down sometimes in order to see and understand what is happening. So psychology and biosciences still have the highest percentages of female graduates. Um, and usually they're talking about both undergraduate and graduate degrees. A psychology is over around 70%. Biological sciences taken as a whole may even hover in the, the upper 50s, uh, low 60%, depending on, on how we are looking at it. Um, of all the science and engineering degrees, this is looking at 2016, uh, we earn just under half uh, of the degrees, but some of the disciplines are carrying more of the weight uh, than others in that space. So for example, looking at engineering, I like to pick on engineering because I am uh, an engineer. Um, and so if we look at the overall absolute numbers of women attaining degrees in engineering, that has actually made significant jumps uh, across uh, the, the decades, looking at 2007 all the way up to 2016. And so you can see that the green bar uh, is showing significant gains in uh, bachelor's and women's degrees. But one of the things we also need to recognize is we are in the rise of sort of the STEM age, and engineering has really done a full court press in terms of getting more students um, to consider this as a degree in discipline. So the overall enrollment of uh, degrees in engineering is increasing. Um, one of the things uh, engineering at Wayne State, for example, is our fastest growing um, uh, for enrollment. And that is reflected in many places across the country. So if you look at the percentage of women who are getting this degree, that is making it more incremental uh, sort of increase, right? So the gains that we're seeing in overall interest in engineering are not being uh, proportionately reflected uh, by women engaging in the field. Computer science is uh, very, very interesting. Um, computer science uh, back in the, the 80s was one of the fields that was making impressive gains in terms of engaging women um, in this discipline. Uh, and then we saw a little bit of sort of a, a drop off or a slowdown in that. But you can see that when we're looking at absolute numbers, we're still making steady gains in absolute numbers. But this is one of those cases where you do have to look at the percentage. So the percentage of women uh, achieving those degrees is dropping uh, precipitously. But you can actually see the same in mathematics, so across the different STEM fields, we're seeing different patterns um, of growth, contraction, um, women making gains, but not gains uh, fast enough, sort of in those ways. And that's one of the places we need to actually do some digging, right? Again, um, we are now in the age where every other student is encouraged to go into computer science, and that's increasing uh, the interest across the board. Um, but the challenges that we have about recruiting across genders in these fields uh, so let's shift a little bit and think about underrepresented students as well. So underrepresented students received about 22% of all science and engineering uh, bachelor's degrees. This is actually a gain uh, as we're looking, but it is still not reflective of population, right? It's still not reflective of uh, national population or in many cases, uh, the enrollment uh, in schools. So it's kind of a mix, it's, it's, it's good news, but then there's sort of a bland face to go along with that. Uh, and again, I think one of the things that we have to remember um, is that um, you do have to dig, right? So you're also going to see different communities making different gains at different rates. So Hispanic and Latinx students um, are making some modest, steady gains in attainment of degrees across the science and engineering fields, while African-American student attainment has essentially remained flat 
um, for the last 10 or 15 years, despite increases in enrollment. Um, and so that is uh, worrisome um, because uh, by other uh, statistics, the overall attainment of degrees by the African American community is increasing, right? So what you're looking at uh, is a challenge inside uh, the STEM space. And so one of the points that I wanted to make here is that when you see things like that and you do a little bit more digging, um, you, you take a sip of your favorite cocktail and then you start looking at intersectionality uh, of certain things. And so when we look at the intersectionality of race and gender, we can actually see that there's a double downward pressure. Um, and I was talking to a colleague and I was saying, ironically, as you can see, this uh, chart shows um, African-American female uh, degree attainment in various science and engineering fields. Uh, and one wonders if um, the rise in psychology degrees is due for the demand of mental wellness professionals for all of the other folks um, in, in the other degrees. Um, as you can see, uh, most in many cases, we are relatively flat uh, in computer sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. Um, we're showing declines. Uh, in terms of the gains of African American uh, women in getting these degree atta attainments. And so one of the things that was very interesting and remains interesting to me about having conversations like this is understanding where the drag is. So when we want to talk about gender equity inside the STEM field, if we have really heavy drags due to other factors as well, those are also the kinds of things that we have to address, right? We're used to doing that with things, say, for example, socioeconomic status, right? We know that socioeconomic status um, leads to variations in academic preparedness, sort of based on oftentimes the um, acumen of the school system that our K-12 students are coming from. So we're very used to considering those two things hand in hand. But we are just getting to the point where we're considering the intersection of race and gender. And what I would suggest is that because of ethnicity and race um, appear to be such a drag, you can do this for, uh, for several of the, um, the female subgroups, that chances are that it's going to have to be addressed simultaneously in order to make the progress that we would actually like to make. Because uh, at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll show you some statistics about what our overall student population is beginning to look we are about to enter a space where the majority of women are represented by one of these underestimated categories. So if we really wanted parity uh, and achieving, we'd have to do that. So where we are, uh, not exactly where we want to be, uh, as the president uh, stated, uh, but given that, you know, we've got a mixed bag. We've got some improvement. We've got some degrees that are clearly making gains, some that are at least uh, holding where we are. Why do we need to move um, beyond just doing the right thing? So four points that I want to make uh, in this space. The first is that women are half the population and have outnumbered men at universities for more than two decades. So this is a really interesting idea, which is that if the majority of our students are opting out from a significant of what we offer. That is not a sustainable business model, right? So that is where that becomes an issue. In 2019, the U.S. public school system officially achieved majority minority status, right? So that gives us, I don't know, 10, 11 years to, to pull this together in terms of thinking through this. Um, and so where we used to be talking about um, student diversity, alternative students, alternative we are indeed, um, and have been watching for a while, sort of a new normal. STEM bachelor's degrees uh, have the fastest growing uh, enrollments um, with the lowest attainment in the largest student population, right? So the majority of our students are female, and that majority is not the one that is driving uh, the increase uh, in degrees in certain fields we're going to actually hit a barrier uh, in terms of our enrollment and our growth and our competitive edge, which is now an incredibly robust uh, education ecosystem. So 
So given the achievement population mismatch that we're watching right now inside the university, our science and engineering graduation rates are not keeping pace with the growth of the related uh, workforce sectors, right? So we've been talking about um, the, the challenges of filling the, the skills in the workforce for quite some time. Um, and I still uh, am a big proponent of colleges and universities um, being quite significant, dare I say most significant, in being able to supply um, the, uh, the folks that we need in the workforce. But we've got a mismatch uh, in terms of what we're able to produce and what is needed based on who's actually uh, coming to us. So these are the whys, right? So we're in a fairly decent place considering where we have been, but I would suggest that this space is not sustainable because our growth and gains in our quote unquote most popular majors are not reflective of where our student population is growing. Um, and that also is mirrored by sort of the needs. So thinking through that, I did mention that we are not amateurs, and we have been doing this for a very long time. And anyone who has been in the space for more than 15 minutes knows that it is hard, right? It, it is very, very hard. Um, and as uh, sort of the quote says, uh, we will do this, I think, one step at a time, one chunk at a time. What we're looking for are levers um, that will ultimately get us to tipping points where we can move. So what do we know about what works? One, I do like to start with giving us credit. So I'm focusing on the big three because I would suggest that the first and the fifth, we have become very, very good at. Um, modern university teaching is highly focused on engaged teaching and interactive learning, right? We've been working through this pedagogy for quite some time. <coughs> Universities have always been bastions of conversation and student interaction and, and thought. Um, and granted, I would say that our liberal arts and science, liberal arts colleagues have really dominated in that space. Um, but in recent years, along the STEM fields, we're much more interactive, much more hands-on. We're thinking about pedagogy in that way. We're training our teachers. Teachers, faculty are training themselves in that space. Uh, the last part of that, which is always uh, the interesting and difficult thing, which is relevant in modern content, right? Literally thinking about what we teach and when we teach it, not just how we teach it. And so we are actually working on those things. And what you're going to notice, the difference between one and five and the big three, is that one and five are pedagogical approaches, right? This is really sort of thinking about how faculty and academic staff, how we can take this on ourselves and think about our approaches. The big three that we are fast becoming genius at really focuses around uh, the student success model, right? Um, and it's really talking about learning about our students. Peer learning communities, the rise of digital and technology natives, self-efficacy versus identity versus competency. Okay, so for those of you who have been in a bubble, these are my new friends from Jumanji, right? Okay, and uh, I always think that sound in a PowerPoint is really, really dangerous, so just imagine with me that you hear the drums. Right, so anyone who has seen the movie knows that when the drums start beating, what you thought was good news is not completely good news, and something is coming. So, fair warning as we step into a space with the drums and talking about our various tools and levers. So, peer learning communities. One of the things that um, we have grappled with, and I think we're in a, in a better place, is understanding what it means when we say we want to give women their own space to learn. We would like to have women support groups. We would like to have the National Society of Black Engineers, which, by the way, that is University of Buffalo's chapter when they came to Detroit. Uh, National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Women Engineers, all of these different kinds of groups. Um, and we even do this, obviously, on the, the K-12 level. And part of that conversation has always been, is it healthy? to isolate those students from the broader community in terms of when they are learning, right? One, is that a fantasy, right? Does that not actually give them the tools they need to sort of think about navigating uh, in the real world? Does it uh, further the isolation um, that they have sort of within the university environment? And what research is now showing is that the concept of communities, 
uh, the concept of belonging, and now we have words for these things, um, is actually really critical to student success, student anxiety levels, student comfort, right? So that there is a way to manage uh, peer learning groups and peer learning communities um, that allow students to build community, to find tribes, to have shared experiences and shared challenges, which ultimately then do help our students navigate in, in the better world. Um, one of the things uh, that tends to happen is when uh, students uh, from underrepresented uh, groups are isolated and run into issues, if they are isolated, the first assumption is that it is me. It must be me, because um, it's just me. Everyone else seems fine, so it must be me. However, if you are in a room of five, and five of you, or even four out of five, have the exact same problem and the exact same issue, you realize, oh, so maybe calculus 17 is hard, and it's not just me. Uh, and so I think that that is one of the challenges uh, that we have. And one of the things that we've learned, and we're getting data, uh, and doing research, and getting some practical um, notes from practitioners about how to do this successfully. It is not as simple oftentimes as giving um, students their own room to do what they, they need to do. The rise of digital and technology made it, right? Um, so of course, we are now uh, welcoming generations of students that have always had a computer. In fact, when you meet my nephew, he will have always had an iPhone. Um, and so when we're thinking about that, right? So, so we think about that and we think about the rise of the STEM and the science related and uh, technology industries. However, there are a couple of things that we need to think about in that space as we talk about tools and levers. Our current best practice for STEM engaged teaching and learning is based on Generation X. And the one thing that we have now begun to articulate is the differences in the, ge in the generations. Everything from preferences around learning, to mentoring and being mentored style, to how we interact as a group. And so this actually calls the question in terms of how we may need to reevaluate, how we may need to reconsider, how we may need to go to the source and ask the incoming generations of students how some of what we consider best practices uh, need to be modified. I can tell you as an exer, I'm more in the just when I have a problem, I will come tell you about it, versus uh, incoming students want to start with community from day one. They want to establish a regular cadence. I'm anticipating a problem, so let's just set up a meeting for every Tuesday, and then you will be there. Curious indicators um, that being a technology native may stifle technology literacy. I was floored. This was one of the contextual uh, questions uh, that came out uh, in PISA. That's uh, one of the international um, assessments of academic uh, student performance. Um, I work with the board that uh, looks at academic performance from the US perspective when we were having this conversation. Being able to use a computer is not the same as understanding how and why it works. And one of the interesting things about being a native to the technology is that you are beyond asking how it works. Right? If you are first coming in contact with a brand new tool, a brand new piece of technology, you are curious slash confused enough to say, okay, how, how, how does this thing work? Right? And so when you're dealing with non-natives uh, in this digital and technology space, we tend to approach, okay, fine, I can figure this out, but like, how exactly does it work? When you're talking about technology natives, it has been so embedded in what we do, that I'm immediately jumped to the use Right? because the use is intuitive. And so it often skips over the question of how and why it works. And uh, in the beginning of, I think, engaging with the, the incoming generation, we made the assumption. Um, and so now we're having to, to walk back uh, and to step back on some of those things. So this, I think, is uh, most encouraging and probably a huge tool. So the millennial generation are also considered diversity natives. As long as they have been sort of evolving and learning and now beginning to work in uh, society, diversity has been the conversation of the day and it has been sort of the, the, the through word 
So that means that there is an expectation. So when we talk about when someone is a native to something, it's what they expect, right? They don't expect to walk into a convenience store and have to use cash. Like, what? Right. So, so that's sort of the way that works. So the same thing when we're talking about diversity, right? You're walking into a room and you're thinking, why does everyone here look like me? Or why does no one here look like me? Versus those of us who are not necessarily natives, who are in the conversation and excited about the growth, will go in and do an assessment. Oh, OK, one, one of those rooms. Oh, this room has made progress. Um, I had that sort of uh, jolt. I was taking my uh, goddaughter. Uh, she was shadowing me uh, one day at work. And one of the events that I had was a board meeting. It's a very large board about 40 people. We've been very proud of ourselves. We've been doing some very strategic work on the nomination committee and really diversifying uh, the board you know, from our perspective. It's so proud. Of it. So, and it was Detroit Public Television, we got PBS, we got Second City, so those kinds of things. When I asked her um, how she felt about the meeting and that conversation, her first response was, there's a lot of white men. <laughs> Yes, as I reflected on it, it was. But I had the perspective of what it was and where we had come. And she brought an expectation that if this is public television and it's Sesame Street and I'm watching them, why doesn't this room look like who you expect to be watching Sesame Street? And so I think that that it can be a powerful advantage to us because um, I think as we are very good at listening to our students um, and what they're indicating to us, uh, we can have a nice uh, gut check. Four, self-efficacy versus identity versus competency. I think one of the most powerful things about the field right now is that we now know these three things are very different and do not necessarily lead to each other. One of the things that research shows Obviously, we are all familiar with the statistic uh, that the drop-off uh, in interest of young ladies in STEM happens in late middle school, right? Seventh and eighth grade, it's like a cliff. It's not even, it's not even so, right? There's a huge drop-off uh, in interest. And if you survey young ladies, you will find that they say, well, I don't really feel like I could do that. Like, that's, that's not my thing. That's, that's not where my strengths are. What the research now shows is those sentiments emerge before, um, I'm sorry, those sentiments emerge while the young ladies are still outperforming the young men in their math and science classes, right? So the competency and the self-efficacy and identity are related, but they're not, um, they're not drivers of each other. Right? And so as we thought about it, we've had different phases where we attacked different things for different communities. Clearly, competency is a necessity. Um, but we have also begun experimenting with when must you be competent, right? If we convince you that this might be something of interest to you and get your commitment to work for it, then can we begin investing in your competency skills. For some students, we're going to be doing it in the other direction. So for example, I was one of those students who was uh, highly competent and highly disinterested simultaneously, right? Um, and part of that was part of the way that STEM defined itself. Uh, we talked about math and science as an end game. We didn't talk about it as a tool. So I'd always been good at math and science, but if you asked me if I'd ever consider a career in one, I would have told you no, um, because I didn't have that level of interest. And it wasn't until we changed the language around talking through math and science as tools. Uh, in various industries, in various strategies, in various research projects that could be relevant to me and my community, that I began to sort of see, have an identity uh, in that space. So the self-efficacy is the belief that you can do it, right? Um, identity is being able to see yourself uh, in that space, and then competency is capacity. So this is where we are, are still struggling in some places. Do you know we still lack conclusive data on what impact role models have on women and so? I am a firm believer um, because I have seen this work effectively. But like many things, it depends on the way that the interactions are designed. 
it is it actually also depends on the way that the role models are presented. Um, there have been some instances where certain programs were studied and the role models were so fabulous. It actually had the opposite effect. Uh, they call it sort of the queen effect, um, that the bar seemed so high and there was a lot of respect and a lot of appreciation uh, for the role models because the idea was they are so special. Um, and so I can't necessarily um, be in that space. Um, but generally speaking, when done right, we do know um, that, that role models um, that uh, represent uh, the students we're trying to reach, uh, particularly at the earlier ages, uh, make a difference. At older ages, it's reinforcement of whatever mindset they're already bringing to the table. And that's where some of the confusion in the data is coming. So that said, we know that the academy looks like the challenge that we are trying to address, right? So what does that mean uh, in terms of trying to grow that? That means we're not actually talking about culturally competent mentoring. We're talking about cross-culturally competent mentoring. And I want to sort of make that, um, that distinction very important. So we are talking about training ourselves to be able to mentor across cultures. Um, authentic and effective mentoring is about being able to honor both folks uh, at the table. And right now, if we're talking about we want more women and more minorities to come through the academy in STEM, we are talking about them being mentored by people who do not look like them and do not have their background, and those kinds of things. And so that becomes a very interesting challenge um, but you know, one them, this is what we do. Uh, we, we solve problems, we do those, those different kinds of things. And if we think through this, right, because we're also in the space where uh, we have folks who have come through the academy. And so when you're talking right now to female scientists, engineers, technologists, um, when you're talking to uh, folks of color who are in this space, it means that we have those experiences, that at some point, Many, if not most of us, were successfully and effectively cross-culturally mentored despite the occasional cultural faux pas uh, that sort of came in there sort of very authentically. And so I think that is one of the things that we actually have to be incredibly uh, deliberate and realistic about. But between these three things, the two, the three, uh, the four, you can see that they are much more student-centric um, and require us to think about um, uh, gathering data um, and working with the student, and one and five are closer to the total control model. As faculty and academic staff, one and five are the things that we essentially have a lot of control over, right? We manage the way we teach, we learn about the ways we teach, um, and we manage and learn about what we teach. Um, I was looking for, you know, a nice picture of, I don't know, effective mentoring or conversation. It's so funny, whenever I Google Mentoring for pictures, all the mentors and mentees look alike. So you have guys mentoring guys, women mentoring women, folks of color mentoring folks of color, which is indeed effective. But it was it was funny because I was trying to make the opposite point and I could not find the picture. And so that also just helps us understand where we are, um, that we were ch we are challenged uh, by thinking through that concept. Okay. So, so, quick reflection, kind of on, on the work in progress, where we are, yeah, mixed outcomes uh, in terms of STEM. We, we've made some progress, but we've clearly got uh, a lot of progress uh, still left to make. Uh, and one of the things we may dig into um, is the differences across the disciplines. But again, I want to reiterate that cross-cultural mentoring is not only just about race and gender, it's also about disciplines, right? The different disciplines have different cultures. And part of what we've got to begin to mind is that there are, are there certain elements of cultures in particular disciplines um, which lend themselves to, uh, to exclusion, um, which may make them less friendly uh, intuitively. Why we need to move? We've got a precipitous pipeline, pipeline to demand and outcome sort of mismatch, right? We are successful. We are, in, in some cases, even growing our student bodies. We've gotten to gender parity 
in our overall student body, but we haven't gotten to gender parity uh, in our fastest growing community. Uh, and the same can be said when we're looking across race and ethnicity, now knowing um, that two generations away, um, we will be looking at majority minority uh, population coming forward. And what are our tools and levers? We've added student-centered models to our pedagogical model, which puts us in a really powerful place. So I remember I was listening to uh, Ambassador Andrew Young, former Ambassador Andrew Young, and he was talking about uh, the civil rights movement, and this was one of his uh, favorite uh, ways of reflecting on, on how they achieved what they achieved. Uh, it's actually a phrase that became the mantra for the U.S. Army Board. Uh, in World War II, uh, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible this next week, a little longer next week, I don't know, maybe I'm okay, something like that. Uh, and so I think part of that is just sort of a very realistic thing. We are talking about um, sort of thinking through issues of parity and equity inside uh, academia, but we are not isolated, right? So a lot of things are in our control, but the majority are not. So as we think through this, where do we want to go? All right, I'm just saying, what if, what if we decided to close all gender and race-based student achievement gaps instead? Hmm. Just decided, I don't know. 2025, no, 2030, 2050 seems kind of far out. 2030 seems kind of close. <clears throat> but I think that. If we really thought in this way, what would it take to close the achievement gaps uh, uh, in that way? Um, and so it's a very ambitious goal. And it's something that clearly comes in the category of, of do the right thing. But I would suggest that many of us who have been in the space, and even some who have just come into the space, think that that is so audacious um, that we set the bar a little bit lower. Uh, than that. But let's just suppose, we said it there, we're just going to close all the gaps. This is the University of Buffalo, you're going to do it first. And so, those are easy steps, if you want to think about that. Favorite education cartoon ever. <clears throat> okay, so we've got the teacher, faculty member, doing really good, has been working with these students all semester long, right? Okay, we, we get to the end of the semester and Clearly, he has gone through his equity training. Right? Okay, clearly, he, he's gone through his equity training. For a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Yay, right? Uh, and so this is part of, I think, the, the way we are structured those kinds of things. And as an engineer, what I would suggest to you is that the only thing wrong with this situation is, you might say, of course, it's the test question. But it is the test question. It's simply not phrased correctly. If the goal is to get to the top of the tree, then that is the exam, not climb the tree. The exam question is, please get to the top of the tree. No caveats, no descriptions on how you can do it. You've been in class for an entire semester. What are the different ways you can get to the top of the tree? This is a fantastic conversation to have with sixth graders, um, and so they will tell you, you know, the different animals can step on top of each other, some of the animals can fly. One of my favorites was the elephant knocks the faculty member out of his chair, turns the desk on its side, and they all just walk up the desk like a ladder. I thought that was appropriate. Um, so part of this is thinking about where we're, where we're framing, right? Thinking about what are our actual learning outcomes and how are we asking students to achieve them? Um, and a lot of times the way we require students to achieve them is more of a suggestion based on what worked for us, based on what has worked uh, previously, but we can reframe if we focus on the outcome. But there are some things that it's time for us to be also more explicit in the conversation of that. So racism is real, really real. Um, but a lot of our language, um, has not allowed us to get to that conversation. So I've noticed some shifts, right? So if anyone has um, been paying attention to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and their, their recent uh, calls for submission, 
they have flipped some of their language from underrepresented to historically excluded, right? Which is a very powerful way of sort of making that shift. It actually not acknowledges that there was an exclusion taking place, which means that it could be infrastructure based right now. And if we don't think through that uh, and how to get through that, um, it is very hard. We will sort of remain in curing the symptoms uh, and not the disease. So I think thinking through, thinking through those kinds of things, um, you know, I know we're fans of new phrases like microaggression, as if there's like little teeny aggressions. That was all really rather aggressive um, and, and noticeable. So I think thinking more candidly about our language, um, thinking about how we're listening, and thinking about how we are giving tools. One of the suggestions is understanding that since we are still talking about underrepresented slash historically excluded slash inequitable situations, all of these successes that our students are making are in the pioneering category, right? So we know there's an entrepreneurial skill set, right? So being an entrepreneur, uh, you're required to bring a slightly different set of skills than say working inside of a larger corporation, right? I would suggest that we also know that being a pioneer takes a different kind of skill set as well. It takes a level of self-motivation. Uh, it takes a level of navigation skills. It takes a level of discernment skills in terms of reading particular situation. Uh, and it takes a level of what I would call multilingual skills, and I'm talking about talking across cultures, that we don't actually uh, emphasize and that we don't, I, I think, incorporate. And this comes when we lean too far on the competency side of the equations, right? So there's a lot more to being a, a mathematician than the math uh, when we're talking about success and retention. And so one of the things that I think that we can take in the next steps is we're reframing and understanding that our current generation and the next generation of students are actually pioneers in this space. This actually applies to our majority students as well, right? So that means that they too are pioneers as majority students in a space that is more diverse than ever before. And they too uh, may need to think about some of the skill sets in terms of we as faculty as well. Step two, tactical renegades. So this is sort of a classic illustration of sort of different ways, different cultures of approach things. So this is part of what we've begun learning around an asset-based mindset. So for example, one of the things we do not do is uh, leverage the lack of privilege that some of our students are working with, right? We talk about socioeconomic disparities, et cetera, et cetera, and then we talk about problem-solving skills. I guarantee you that if you are one of four children, there's one vehicle, no public transportation, you too have class that starts at 8, your brother has class that starts at 8.30, your mom's got to be at work by 9.15. There is some incredible level of problem solving going on in that household. Time management skills are off the charts. So I think in terms of thinking through that, we have done a lot of that with the curriculum, right? So even when we're talking about some of our environmental um, uh, engineering sustainability classes, we have begun to do projects with our students that focus on the neighborhoods and communities where they're from, right? Because it's relevant and they can relate. What I am suggesting is that we can also make relevant and relate to life experiences and life skills that our students do not realize translate into what we're trying to teach them, translate uh, into uh, different disciplines. This can also even work, say, for our returning students as we think about students who are now of an age where they are also simultaneously caregivers uh, of, of aging family members, um, family members uh, with different abilities, um, and the way that um, those challenges uh, have changed their relationship to technology. Right? So one of the things, you know, my mother is, is now aging, she got a lot of technology in her house because we are always <laughs> she was always turning stuff off, and we figured out her remote turn it back on. We learned not to hook it up to her Amazon Prime account, but ours. So all of these different kinds, all of these different kinds of things um, that are actually quite relevant um, to to the distance we're trying.
trying to teach. Mind the exceptions for new standards. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, if we consider, if we take into reframing that um, racism and uh, infrastructure block, block, blocks are real, if we take into account that some disciplines still have not cracked enough uh, in terms of thinking about parity and equity, um, that means that those who make it through are indeed exceptions. The question is, should they be considered exceptions to the rule? Right? So what we have not done yet is mine the individuals who made it through for whatever their tactics were. Right? They could have been intuitive, they could have been deliberate, there could have been some secret guerrilla army helping them study at night. We don't know. Um, but I would also say that that is in-house. As I look at this room, we know that we actually have pioneers in first generation men and women um, of color and of majority who came through in spaces they were not supposed to come through. Have we asked those questions? Have we mined those experiences for different sort of tactical geniuses? I think one of the things that, that really did aggravate me when I was coming through uh, and getting my studies is that I was considered an exception to the rule and that no one was taking my experiences and trying to make them universal trying to use that to say, well, you know, wow, okay, I guess uh, students that look like her and have some background actually can sort of do this. I was put in my own sort of separate category, and it's not until recently where I had sort of considered how I could use my experiences myself um, to help support um, becoming certain standards, trying to dissect which things are about my personality, but which things were really practical and strategic that I was for example, before peer learning communities became a thing, I was creating my own, right? I would find sort of different tribes um, outside of my discipline for, for different communities, and we now know that that's a thing. So I think uh, in terms of becoming tactical ren renegades and doing deeper mining of what we already know, this is also going to take a bit of a shift. Um, this is true at Wayne State, may or may not be at the University of Buffalo, and I would say candidly that there are some um, areas of research which are considered higher priority and have more broad path than others. So research into basic science is considered to have more broad path into research into how to better teach basic science. And if we really want to get into this space, we're going to have to do some shifting uh, in that. We're going to need our best and brightest uh, and our geniuses to want to actually be in that space to figure out how it is that some students uh, learn above the law. Last but not least, uh, number three, claim audacious 21st century ambition. So this is really interesting, uh, and it was part of a conversation that I, I had um, sort of mid last year about sort of the changing ecosystem, the changing face of, of STEM, uh, and where universities could play a role. So one of the big things around STEM right now is the rise of the STEM ecosystem, right? It's, it's everywhere. You've got MOOCs, you've got badges, you've got certifications, you've got apprenticeships, you've got colleges and universities, you've got, I'm just going to get them on the job training. You've got the Khan Academy. You've got, I'm going to teach myself, and then I'm going to found my own company. <coughs> In my basement, I'm become a billionaire, and I'm going to sell books. Okay, so you've got the whole gambit of the ecosystem. And up until this point, we as universities have considered that a challenge, right? It's the competitive environment. Have we considered that universities in particular can be our own ecosystem? We are so large and so diverse and so potentially cross and interdisciplinary that we can actually a STEM ecosystem in and of itself. That is not the way we necessarily communicate ourselves right now. We like to promote um, our expertise, which is very important and will remain critical. But what I would suggest uh, is that I could name a couple of universities that actually have more course offerings than Coursera. As a matter of fact, we're actually moving the courses on Coursera. Uh, I know that is true here at the University of Buffalo as well. And so thinking about the, uni the, the university as its own ecosystem, right? And so it's not that the, the STEM ecosystem is our competitor. It is the new way.
way that students and continuous learning professionals are expecting to be able to learn. The second is we have a self-generated pipeline. So uh, as we have a K-12 uh, outreach program, I got to meet with some of the K-12 uh, coordinators and uh, folks here at UD uh, yesterday. As we shift from thinking about our work in the community from outreach to actually pipeline, we are literally sitting on our own pipeline. Uh, and if we think about those K-12 students as our future undergraduates, as we think about them in the context of our fears about decreasing university enrollment, about um, broader choices that students can have, uh, we need to actually think uh, about our K-12 uh, interventions much more in an outreach. Last but not least, literacy is the new STEM currency, right? You hear it all the time. You got digital literacy, computational literacy, engineering literacy, scientific literacy. It's not what you know, it's how you use what you know, right? This is this cross-conversation, interdisciplinary work. Um, and universities have long been bastions of critical thinking and critical discussions. Universities have always been about uh, literacy, but often this philosophy and this pedagogy have been confined a little bit on our liberal arts section. That's where we have these, uh, these discussions. But it does mean that it's embedded in our DNA uh, and actually in our culture. And so, um, as this becomes more the master conversation, I do actually believe that of all the institutions that are touting these literacy-minded uh, ways of thinking through these subjects, we are actually in the best position to dominate um, because we have it all in house. Granted, I still am a big fan of partnerships and collaborations, but we are the ones that folks will want to collaborate and partner with because we do offer uh, so much variety. Um, I have a question from one of uh, your students yesterday about could engineering be used as a tool in socioeconomic disparity? Not just about giving people jobs, you know, could that be a systems engineering question that we can sort of figure out? Those are the kinds of questions you can actually ask at university because we have social justice gurus, we have epidemiologists, folks, we have sociologists, we have engineers, and that kind of thing. So this is a place uh, where we uh, constantly gather together. Um, and so this is, you know, the last slide uh, before I just sort of put the slide that has my contact information and we have questions, but it's also a reminder, I wonder what teachers make a difference. <laughs> I think part of this is because we are reflective, because we are self-aware, we give ourselves a hard time constantly, right? We've got good news and we're like, but it's not good enough. <coughs> We've made strides, but we still got far to go. And I'm trying to convince you that your 2050 goal should be a 2035 goal and that you can do the impossible. But I think